Good evening, everyone. Since I haven't spoken to you on this platform since 2021, Happy New Year and Happy Black History Month. Let's get started. This year, the national theme for Black History Month is Black Health and Wellness. In keeping with that theme, there will be opportunities for you to learn about how to maintain good health and work on your fitness. Join us online every Monday at noon for Lift It, a fitness series just for you, led by our very own Ms. Chandra Barnett and Ms. Marnie Robinson. Here on The Avenue, we will be discussing various aspects of black health and wellness in a series that we are calling Vitamins, Veggies, and Vacations. I am excited about this because we will be speaking with a doctor, restaurant and bakery owners, as well as bed and breakfast owners. You'll get more information on all of that in the coming weeks, but today we are kicking things off by having a very important discussion about how the things that we put into our bodies affect us. Historically, lack of transportation, resources, healthcare, and other factors such as religion, etc., led African Americans to utilize what we call home remedies. Many of us have used and benefited from a good home remedy through the years, and now more than ever, people are seeking ways to naturally boost their immune systems and heal their bodies. When done correctly, this is a great thing, but how do we know for certain that the all-natural supplements on the shelves are really making and keeping us healthy? This evening, Dr. Baxter Montgomery is speaking with us about all things pertaining to natural healing. He is no stranger to Wheeler Avenue as he is a part of our family and has been for many years. Dr. Montgomery founded his practice Montgomery Heart and Wellness in 2006 with the mission to reverse and prevent life-threatening illnesses. He is a board-certified cardiologist with years of experience in the latest medical practices and nutritional health. Turn the volume up, you won't want to miss a word he says. Good evening, Dr. Montgomery, and thank you so much for joining us virtually on the Avenue this evening. How are you? I'm doing fine. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for having me. Of course. So we're one month into 2022, and many people like to kick off the new year by fasting, dieting, exercising, and just making other lifestyle changes. Um, a go-to that we hear all the time now is plant-based living, on which you happen to be an expert. So can you talk to us a little bit about your work as a cardiologist and nutritionist and how you got into taking a more natural approach to treating your patients? Oh, uh, great question. And, you know, um, I was trained in, in, you know, a number of specialties, internal medicine, then especially in cardiology, then cardiac electrophysiology. And then, you know, after many years of training and, you know, developing very specific expertise, I got into my private practice and started seeing patients, you know, on a regular basis, obviously. And in training, in certain parts of training, you, you know, you're on this rotation, you see patients, then you move out. So, you, you don't get as much of a longitudinal perspective in terms of a person, you know, this year, the person five years later than five years after that. But in private practice, your patients are almost like your family members. And so you become acutely aware, at least I became acutely aware of how, <clears throat> despite the advancing in medical technology, you know, the, the fancier medications, the more advanced medication, more advanced procedures and technology and devices I implanted, uh, despite all of that, the patients continue to get sicker. And so, you know, I realized that there was something more fundamental to, you know, progressive illness than, you know, the lack of, you know, medications and new medication, new technologies. And, and we often think of that. And so as it happened, you know, early in my practice, I said, you know, I was implanting devices, doing cording procedures and the like. Uh, and then I ran across one patient who, who was taking supplements. Now, keep in mind, I was always interested in wellness, this whole concept of wellness. So it was something that, that you know, I, I gained some interest in my training and uh, <clears throat> I wanted to do it, although I didn't know exactly what that meant. You know, I figured, okay, exercise and nutrition, whatever that was. However, a person, uh, one of my patients came, he was taking a lot of supplements, he was seeing an herbalist and I was intrigued with that. So 
uh, my nurse practitioner and I one day, you know, took some time off, went to the herbalist office and, and visited with and said, okay, well, you know, what is about, you know, what is it with these herbs and things? And, and she shared a lot of information. So that was one step into that, you know, area of holistic, natural, whatever the case is. As time continued to pass, I read more books on my own, mostly in the lay press about different natural approaches. And one thing I understood was a common denominator is always healthy diet. In regards to whatever the label of the healthy diet is, it's always going to have some type of plant-based food. So whether you call the healthy diet Mediterranean diet or you call the healthy diet, you know, paleo, whatever, you're always going to have healthy plant-based foods. And, and as we know, the original diet that God prescribed for us in Genesis 129 was a plant-based diet, seed-bearing plant-based foods. And so that, as I understood, became the foundation of a healthy diet. Um, I took a, and I don't know how this came about. I received some flower from somewhere and I took this course. It was a weekend crash course on, on learning how to prepare raw vegan food. So I did a raw vegan food. I became a certified raw vegan chef. And uh, it was a Saturday, Sunday, all day long crash course. We were preparing meals, tasting things. But during the course of that, you know, two days, I received a lot of information, resources, books about the benefits of plant-based diet. And uh, one of those resources was a local person uh, named John Rose. And he was kind of a local guru. I never met him, never heard of him before then. Uh, but I called him and met him. And uh, I met with him for about maybe five or six hours on the Whole Foods. And we sat down and this guy seemed to know everything about food. So I took his course, which was he coached me through a 30-day ended up being 33 days, raw juice feast. So my first exposure to plant-based eating was doing a raw juice feast detox. Now, you know, I was a busy cardiologist, cholesterol was a little bit up, my weight was a little bit up, my pressure probably a little bit up, you know, not sleeping, et cetera. When I went through this raw detox course, now, of course, I was still busy seeing patients and the like, I literally felt like I was 18 years old. In four weeks, it just kind of turned the clock around. And that was quite an eye opener. It wasn't, I mean, yeah, I dropped some weight here and that didn't matter. I've done other things that lost weight before. It was something different about this. It was like my body had a charge. Uh, I was walking and I didn't quite feel my feet touch the ground. It was almost like I was floating. My mental clarity was higher. I mean, it's just, and I woke up. And so there was a charge to my system that I didn't have before. Uh, and, um, and, I, and, and I'll explain a little bit later why that might be the case when you change your diet a certain way. So anyway, I said, look, this is amazing stuff. So I can stay plant-based. And I did. After the 33-day juice feeds, I continued eating plant-based foods. But I ate some you know, vegan junk food here and there. Every year, I do another you know, raw detox juice feeds. Again, feel that charge. And over the years, I realized that there was a difference in terms of you know, plant foods. You can eat unhealthy plant foods and healthy plant foods. And so I developed a food classification system where you know, I structure food based on the level of health. It's not just, you know, you can have broccoli or you can have okra and they can be very healthy, it can be very unhealthy. It depends on what you do to them. And so the classification system dictates, okay, it's not only what you eat, but how you know, much processing there is and how it's grown, et cetera, et cetera. So as I started to share this information with patients, um, I became amazed of the changes that they have. I remember one patient in particular, uh, a lady who had diabetes, arthritis, she had coronary disease, she had had a four vessel bypass surgery, maybe five years prior to me seeing her, her heart was being at 10, 15%. She had just come out of the hospital from a urinary tract infection. She was on 21, 22 medications. And um, so I saw her for the first time and I looked at the medication list. She was on a wheelchair, on oxygen, her husband wheeled her in. I said, you know, what am I gonna do? I had the 23rd medication. So I asked them one question. I said, look, do you have a juicer? And they said, yeah, they had the old Jacqueline juicer. And in their day, you know, Jacqueline made juicing popular. I think it was still sitting in the box of the house according to them. So what I told them, I wrote out a bunch of juicing recipes. And I said, for the next 10 days, I want you to just drink these juices. I mean, I wrote out different recipes, don't eat anything, and adjust to medications as necessary, as needed. 
I kid you not, in 10 days, she came back to the office, no wheelchair, no oxygen, walking, talking, and laughing. Arthritis was much better. She was on half a medication, didn't need to take the insulin, et cetera. Wow. This kind of amazing story was the norm. Everybody that followed the program within seven to 10 days was, you know, had an amazing change. The only people that failed on were the people who failed to follow. And there were very few because when you get them on for seven days, everybody can do it. So what we did is over time, we developed a process where we put people on detoxes and I would do seven days at a time and see them for four weeks and we give them recipes. And that evolved into, you know, nutritional classes, we call them boot camp classes and, and so on and so forth. And, you know, I can kind of get into those details as we get to the discussion, but that was really how I got into it. You know, I had my own busy practice, had some own health challenges and, you know, just out of the blue was introduced to this process and this eye-opening moment of, hey, this is something different. And again, I had practiced, um, you know, I've been 25 years, over a quarter century uh, between practice and training in the world's largest medical center with the greatest technology there is. So it's not like I was out in the sticks somewhere. So I saw changes in food that I had not seen in, in the most advanced medical therapies on the planet. Wow, incredible. Um, you said something that, that really stuck out to me um, about the vegetables. Um, are we really doing a disservice to ourselves if we think, you know, we're eating healthy and we're cooking these vegetables, but we're cooking all of the nutrients out of them? Yeah, that's a great question. And, you know, cooking, here's my take on it. So if you look at plants, let's, let's start with the green leafy greens. Maybe you got spinach in the garden, a kale or collards or whatever. Those greens are taking light, radiant energy from the sun. You have that radiant energy from the sun and it's going to the greens, so a process called photosynthesis. That energy is being transformed into another form of energy, you know, uh, carbohydrates and the light. But in addition to that, you have an electrical charge that's also in that raw food. And that electrical charge gets passed on to you when you eat those foods in the raw natural state. When you cook the foods, not only do you lose the nutrients as you point out, so let's say nutrients are the minerals, the vitamins, you know, the other phytonutrients, uh, you're losing that, maybe some of the fibers denatured, some of the proteins denatured, but that electrical charge is also dampened. And, and, and people have done uh, experiments where they've done what's called Kirlian photographs, you do a Kirlian photograph of a raw plant food, you'll see radiance coming from the uh, uh, food. And after you cook the food, that amount of radiance, so you know, like you look at the sun, you see the sun, you have a kind of a, a glare, radiance. Well, food has that too. And so you have a piece of spinach and you have the radiance of the spinach. When you cook it, it has less radiance. And I'll probably try to do, um, during the course of our conversation, I may pull up something online and try to show you some images. So cooking the food does a number of things. As you pointed out, you're losing nutrients, but there's some other biochemical and electrical charge components of the food that, that is lost. And, and I want to kind of emphasize that point because when we think of food, we think of you know, the macromolecules, well, fats, carbs, protein. Everybody likes protein. Where do you get your protein? Where do you get your protein? But foods have minerals. They have electrolytes. They have phytochemicals, uh, other vitamins. And these things are extremely important for your body to function. And so not only do you use these things, but they also have a charge. And when I mentioned when I did the juice feast, I had a bit of a charge. When you eat raw food as food as close as natural state, not only are you getting those nutrients, but you get an electrical charge that that food can bring to your system. So do you suggest that it's not good enough to just be plant-based? Because as you said, there's all, there are also some you know, plant-based meats and, and just vegan junk food that you know, people have been introduced to and they think, oh, because you know, it's not meat, it's healthy or it's good for me. Um, what, what do you say about that? So well, that's a great point. And the thing is this, um, a lot of so-called plant-based meats are probably 
as unhealthy or maybe even more unhealthy than uh, animal protein. For instance, I can probably prescribe you a 100% vegan slash plant-based diet with the right type of foods, or I should say perhaps the wrong type of foods. And then I could put somebody else on an animal protein diet with a lot of healthy foods mixed with a little animal protein. And the person on the vegan diet could get sicker than the personal animal because the food, they may be eating all toxic foods. And a lot of people who eat the quote unquote vegan diet are eating a lot of vegan junk food and are not getting in natural stuff. Everything's cooked. And then stuff is processing at chemical additives, preservatives and dyes and all that. That makes it just as bad. Now, food classification system take these into place. So in the food classification system, the lower the number, the healthier. So zero is like a raw juice or water. Uh, Ten is the most unhealthy food you can have. So you might have, you know, pork ribs and chicken fried steak, but you may also have some raw vegan food out there too at a 10. Maybe it'd be a fried Beyond Burger patty or something. So you have very unhealthy vegan foods. And, and that's why we, we don't even use the, the, the term vegan when we talk to our diet, our patients. We may use healthy plant-based, but we talk about on the food level classification system, uh, and it makes a difference. And, and, and one other footnote is that when we get our patients to start on a regimen, the, the, the usual, or I should say conventional wisdom, is that you have someone do things in moderation. And, and on the surface, that seems you know, nice. Do it in moderation. Just cuddle back here, cuddle back there. And, and that's fine. The problem with that is the following. We have to take into account that these foods that we love that don't love us, uh, we love them not because they're so good to us. We love them because we're addicted to them. And if you take an alcoholic and says, well, I'll tell you what, why don't you just cut back on the alcohol? And, you know, I guess that sounds reasonable. But most people who cut back won't stop. Uh, maybe they go to AA uh, clinic and say, okay, we'll have martinis once a week. Well, eventually they're going to be drinking as much as they were before. If you're addicted to something, you want it. So to get rid of the want, you have to eradicate it from your palate. And so what we do is what we put people on a very, uh, I like to say precise, not extreme. It's not extreme. It's very precise nutritional regimen where you get 100% raw plant-based food for four weeks. But what you do is you mark the calendar. You say, okay, I'm going to go through this. You get your plan. You get all the healthy plant foods you want. And of course, we have a restaurant that creates gourmet raw plant foods that so helps the palate. And when they do this for four weeks, they come off and say, you know what? This is great. Now, yeah, they want something, but a little bean soup, a little steamed broccoli, it's going to be like, you know, steak or potatoes. Your taste buds have changed. Your mind has changed. Your psychology has changed. Uh, and it's the changing of your palate. You want to change your want to's as it comes to food. And, and that's how that works. <clears throat> so after those four weeks, um, for instance, if someone were to maybe relapse and maybe run by Chick-fil-A or something, will that send them right back to where they were when they, before they started the plant-based? Great, great point. So the other benefit of the four weeks, which I, I forgot to, 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 kind of emphasize, which your question is going to bring out, is that you go through a biochemical change. Most people, not everybody, it's not 100%, but most people go through such a change where if they're on raw fruits and vegetables for four weeks and they go back and have the Chick-fil-A, one, it's not going to taste very good. Two, it may make them sick. There's one story I'll share with you a patient, a lady who did a nutritional detox, raw fruits and vegetables in our boot camp class a number of years ago. So she did it. She was 100%. She did great. She was feeling great. She said, look, I did this program. I was 100% and I'm going to reward myself. So shortly after that, she went, uh, had lunch with some friends of hers and they went to you know, a nice restaurant. And so she said, I'm going to have a salad with some strips of chicken. You know, everything in the salad was salad, regular salad dressing. So she sat at the table, ate her salad with the chicken strips. And I guess she got it maybe a third to halfway through the salad. This is her telling the story. And she got so ill. She started vomiting and having diarrhea at the table. 
She got violently ill. Now, this is an extreme example. Most people don't have this. But I, I, I say this to make the point. The body, when it becomes pristine and it starts to, it starts to reject these things because these things become repulsive. So that biochemical change creates some of a, somewhat of an anti-abuse effect. That's why I like the raw detox up front. Now, yeah, people do relapse. I mean, I, mean, I said virtually 100% of people do. But the point I'm making is that when they do relapse, the food they go back to is not quite as, invi as, inv as inviting as the food they had prior to the detox. And virtually everyone has a fundamental change in the way they eat. They become more conscious of what they're putting in their mind and so on and so forth. Um, what we do is we have programs to support people on that journey. We do the detox and then we support you with certain um, steamed veggies and dehydrated foods that like we have beet burgers, raw pizzas. So there are a lot of things that you can do that's in a gourmet raw range that really can replace it. So, you know, we made... Um, we make a gourmet raw pizza and my son, who's not plant-based, I, I brought a large pizza, had him taste a slice and he tasted, this is great. This is better than Domino's. Uh, the taste and the textures uh, of raw food is far richer than a lot of the stuff you're getting that's overcooked, salty and, and overladen with oil. Well, I have always been intrigued by home remedies. Um, something that we're seeing a lot now is people are trying to boost their immune systems to be able to fight and prevent COVID-19 and all of the variants. Um, there's You have the turmeric, the honey, ginger, all of these things. Um, but for those who are not you know, ready to go as extreme as a, a fully plant-based diet or a juice cleanse, um, what are some of the slight but effective changes that we can make that will boost our immune systems? So that's a great question. What you can do is you can load your system. So let's say, for instance, so I'm not ready to go 100% plant-based because that's the psychological part. And, and, and let me put this, let me put it, um, let me explain something this way. The challenge of going 100% plant-based isn't eating the plant-based food, it's the removing the other stuff. I mean, the most unhealthy eater on the planet, you know, it probably has something, you know, green leafy past their, you know, lips every now and then. So the eating of healthy food, almost anybody can do, is the absolute removal of the other stuff. And we have this not a bite, not a drop, not a crumb uh, mantra. So Let's say you're not ready for that. So then what I say, I kind of flip the switch. And that happens to a lot of kids when I've had families that have kids and kids are, I can't do that, I want to do it. So what I'll say, start with superfoods. So you want to start your morning off with, of course, drinking water. For instance, I'm, I'm going to hold this bottle up, I drink, you know, I don't want to, but, but uh, and, and I have to kind of psychologically force myself to drink uh, two liters in the morning and then throughout the day I drink but then you want to eat your water. So you drink your water and you eat water. What I mean by eat your water, you want to consume foods that are very hydrated. What is foods are hydrated? Well, when watermelon season, I, you know, eat a watermelon. Now, get the watermelon that's with seeds, preferably organic. It's hard to get them with seeds in the store. You got to find somebody that's growing it. Um, um, other melons, you know, cantaloupe, honeydew melon, uh, apples within season, eat apples. Uh, you know, citrus in season, like grapefruit. I eat grapefruit even if it's not contraindicated for the medications you're taking. So you want to hydrate yourself a lot of foods. Also, I have a patient do a lot of leafy greens in the morning. Uh, people say, well, you know, they think oatmeal and all this stuff. And nothing wrong with oatmeal. There's some things wrong with oatmeal. I'm not getting into that. But I tell people to eat leafy greens. So uh, if you have a meal that has, you know, get some spinach or kale, uh, just eat it raw, get some grapefruit, simple things like that to nourish the body early in the morning. Uh, we get our patients on a super green, a blue green algae. Um, and also make, lots of people have moringa, lots of people have spirulina. You can mix uh, healthy smoothies that don't have dairy in it or, or, or eggs and have a healthy smoothie with these super greens in it. So I would do a lot of super greens, super foods in the morning hydrating things in the morning because you want to flush your system out in the morning. So you get your day started out right. What does that do? That does a number of things. When you get super nutrients in the body early on, the biochemical effects on the brain is such that it helps cut those cravings. It helps reduce those cravings. So if you drink in a very large green smoothie, 
uh, and it has kale and spinach and dandelion and, and, and blue green algae, and it has a number of other things in it, then come say brunch lunchtime, you may be hungry, but you may not be craving the same types of food you were craving, you know, if you weren't hydrated and weren't well nourished. And you continue to do that, that does several things. It has a medicinal effect. It decreases inflammation. Now you mentioned coronavirus, you know, coronavirus or any other infection, the mechanism by which these infections cause illness <clears throat> isn't so much the infection itself per se. What happens is that when a foreign entity get in your body, coronavirus or whatever it is, you have two parts of your immune system. You have the innate immune system and the adaptive immune system. The innate immune system is your skin, your mucous membranes, ciliary um, uh, fibers, uh, certain white cells, killer T cells, et cetera. These are the guys standing guard, okay? And so they're standing guard then attention. If you're eating a very poor diet, what happens to your immune system is that it's put in disarray. So your guys are standing guard. Just think, you know, you got a house and you got guards and that type of thing. And the guards have got weapons. So let's say instead of feeding your guard green juice, et cetera, you're giving them alcohol and cheeseburgers. So they're kind of sleepy, a little bit drunk. And somebody tries to get in your house, and they're kind of crawling around and they're a little bit slow and they're drunk, a little bit wheezy. So they get into the front door and the front house. So the criminals are in the house. And then the guards get startled. Then first they're sleepy, they're slow to respond. So then when the criminals get in the house there, then they over respond. They get the guns out and they start shooting at the criminals and start shooting at the people that live in the house. And so that's an over response. That's how the immune system is. And so the innate immune system, when it's in disarray due to unhealthy lifestyle, poor sleep, poor diet, et cetera, then it's slow to respond and it overreacts. So that's when you hear people going into ARDS, getting on ventilators, they're going into sepsis syndrome, uh, cytokine storms, they develop blood clots through the excessive inflammation. All these mechanisms are well known and they happen in any other systemic infection. So what you do when you're eating these greens and things like that, you are decreasing the amount of inflammation, you're calming down the immune system, you have those guards to be more alert and more responsive. And so the more you do that, the better off. In fact, in the British Medical Journal, um, well, there was a study published in the British Medical Journal that showed people on a plant-based diet had fewer symptoms of coronavirus and less severe coronavirus infection than people on a high animal protein diet. And they looked at uh, the, the plant-based diet versus pescatarian is better than pescatarian, which is better than a standard American diet. And the standard American diet is a little bit better than the keto diet, which had a lot more animal protein. So we know biochemically, uh, and there's also other studies showing antiviral effects of plant-based foods. So by consuming these foods early in the morning, you're starting to have an antiviral effect. You're sort of helping your immune system out. And then maybe you have a big salad in the middle of the day, maybe in the evening time. Again, you don't want to be plant-based. So you add a little whatever you want to add. Uh, in the evening time, but by then you've loaded your body up with all these phytonutrients and hydration and you're feeling better and you're going to do better overall. Well, no eggs, no bacon, no sausage for breakfast. <laughs> Preferably not. You know, I grew up on eggs, bacon, and sausage. And so I, I clearly understand that, you know, it's, it's nothing like waking up in the morning, Saturday in the morning, you're smelling the bacon, you know, the biscuits. You know, when I was a kid, we, I don't know if they have, I mean, I don't look at this food anymore, but when I was a kid, you had, um, there was a brand called 1869 Biscuits. Do they have those still? I don't know. And, I don't and know. <laughs> the thing is that, and then we, then we had some of the, we, we, there was another biscuit, I can't think of the name of those biscuits. They were kind of, you know, layered. But the 1869 Biscuits, they were kind of old fashioned biscuits. Now, I don't know what old fashioned biscuit was, but it kind of reminisced of an old biscuit maybe you had in the Western day. I, mean, I love those biscuits. I mean, we had eggs and, and every Sunday morning we have pancakes. And uh, I mean, it's good, you know, it was quote unquote good food. And so I clearly understand the emotional attachment of those foods. But, but, but one thing I know for sure is that I don't miss those foods at all. I mean, I get up in the morning and uh, my first meal is around 11. Sometimes I'll eat, you know, spinach and sprouts and, and, uh, and some um, grapefruit and the taste buds, your taste buds change where, wow, this is my new bacon and eggs. 
Um, but if you try, the other thing we try to have people do, again, you can do these things without having to go 100% vegan. Although I, rep I recommend 100%, but if you don't do 100%, if you start eating some bitter food, so let's say you have like a sweet tooth, right? So a lot of people are addicted to sugar. I think virtually all of us are addicted to sugar. I mean, I, I like eating dates. I mean, that's, you know, we're giving sugar all our lives. This is one of the things we probably work our way off of. But with a sweet tooth, what you want to do is consume more bitter foods. Now, it's not like you eat everything bitter, but what you'll say is that, okay, in the morning, I'm going to have um, a handful of watercress and a handful of dandelion. Those are really bitter greens. So you chew it and you frown, rinse it out with water, and just do it every morning. But what you do is you start to stimulate these bitter receptors. It has a health benefit, but it also can take away a bit of your sweet tooth. And so just by, and, and these things you can just do intentionally that can have a medicinal effect, okay? Uh, I'm not prescribing, I mean, I've prescribed many, many pills over my, my over, you know, quarter of a century practice, but uh, this is by far more powerful prescription. So we eat these bitter greens and it's not gonna be fun at first, but again, you're just gonna chew it, rinse it down, get it out however, and then, you know, eat whatever you're gonna eat, but it's gonna help you in a healthy way, help change your taste buds, et cetera. So while we're on the topic of immune boosters, um, I do want to talk about vitamins for just a moment. Um, some of them have so much sugar and so many chemicals that it seems like some of them might be doing a little more harm than good. So what are some tips that you have for choosing the right vitamins? You know, that's such a great point because, um, you know, there are a lot of the vitamin industry is, is huge. I don't know the number, but it's huge. And a lot of people get the vitamins over the counter. So, you know, they'll hear something online or whatever by vitamin, whatever it does, whatever. And then they'll go to the local store, even some of the health food stores. And you have to remember the, the stores are commercial entities. And so, you know, they're going to be compete with price and that type of thing. Uh, so you go to a certain, you know, either drugstore or healthy store, whatever, and you get these vitamins and of course they compete with price. So what comes in the vitamins is going to be empty fillers. You got dyes. You may not have the adequate amount of the vitamin that's in it. So it becomes a problem because not only does the, the, the vitamin supplement in that setting doesn't do what it's purported to do, uh, but it may actually cause harm because as you point out, you have the sugars in it, uh, dyes, chemical preservatives, et cetera. These things can raise your blood pressure up and cause... And one patient was on some kind of an herbal diet supplement, blood pressure went up, heart rate went up. Uh, and so they not only could be, not only not be doing the good things you wanted to do, but could be causing a harm. So what I recommend to my patients is that um, ideally you should get your vitamins and mineral supplements from uh, a doctor that's experienced with it. There are a lot of functional medicine doctors, you know, uh, holistic doctors who, who, you know, their experience in the context, not only they, they study it, but they manage a lot of patients with vitamins and things. And so you want to do that. With our patients, you know, we have vitamins uh, and supplements and we use a targeted approach. So what we do is one, we try to get them on as healthy diet as possible, but also we look at the labs and we do some specialized tests. We do um, say a neutral valve test where you can look at intracellular vitamins and minerals. It shows the biochemical path pathways to see what you're deficient in. So we do a number of these things where we can say, okay, you're deficient here, you're deficient there. And we may, you know, use a set of vitamins in a targeted fashion. Uh, if you have a certain health condition, uh, if you have heart failure, we may give you a supplement with coenzyme Q10, uh, which, you know, enhances mitochondrial function, enhances cardiac function. Um, if you have core disease or vascular disease, then put you on a high dose liposomal vitamin C. Uh, the liposomal means that the vitamin C is inside a uh, uh, fat uh, envelope where it gets absorbed more easily. So you can get a higher dose orally than you could on, say, buffered vitamin C or other vitamin Cs. So, you know, we, we have a targeted approach. Uh, today I've seen a patient. And your elevated blood pressure, I put on super greens, a blue green algae, uh, I put on some magnesium, uh, and I gave her an L citrulline supplement with health supply to dilate the blood vessels. So, there are a number of different supplements that you, know, you can start 
Um, ideally, you want to be with a professional that, you know, the number of holistic doctors around or, uh, or, or naturopathic doctors, not, well, naturopathic doctors don't practice in Texas, but uh, functional medicine doctors in the area who experience with, you know, using these supplements and, and, and then follow up on your results uh, after. Um, uh, but immune boosting things, uh, mm -hmm. the key things, I think, uh, vitamin C is good. Vitamin C has anti-inflammatory effects. Uh, uh, and and uh, it reduces what we call oxidative stress. Oxidative stress is where your body, think of oxidative stress as a buildup of toxic chemicals. So when we take in you know, toxins through our food or through poor sleep or whatever, um, the adverse effects of poor food, poor sleep is such that you bring in molecules that lack an electron and that makes them unstable. So it's kind of like a radioactive molecule. And these molecules can damage DNA, they can damage cellular tissue, can damage you know, uh, cells, tissue. And an antioxidant, when it meets up with a, uh, a free radical, which causes, you know, a free radical is the toxin, it will then donate an electron to it and then stabilize that free radical. So just think of oxidation stress and oxidation, we know what it is. If you bite into an apple, sit on the counter, you see it turn brown. That's oxidation. And that whole degeneration of turning brown is what happens in our body. That's chronic illness. And that's due to unstable molecules. So by consuming antioxidants, green, leafy greens, and plant foods, it stabilizes these free radicals and it creates, it reduces oxidative stress. Vitamin C is one molecule that does that. Um, other things that boost the immune system Quercetin has anti-inflammatory effects. Uh, if you combine it with zinc, it can have an antiviral effect. Uh, quercetin could uh, form as an ionopore, which means that it's an uh, ion created channel which the zinc can get inside the cell and then go and kill the virus. Um, and so uh, quercetin and zinc, vitamin C, you wanna do things that increase uh, glutathione. Glutathione is a very powerful antioxidant and it uh, reduces inflammation. And glutathione is really important in the mitochondrial function. Mitochondria is the energy um, uh, uh, component of the cell. And, and some people theorize that because we have a microbiome and our body lives in, in symbiosis with bacteria and viruses. So our microbiome is important. And, and some people theorize that uh, a mitochondria is kind of extension of that microbiome, if you will, long time ago, you know, our bodies living with microbes, you know, the, the, the uh, mitochondria became part of the cell itself. And so it's kind of an extension of our microbiome or, or symbiotic relationship with bacteria because the, the mitochondria is like a, a functioning cell, except it doesn't have a nucleus and your cell has a nucleus. But anyway, glutathione improves mitochondrial function, which improves energy production, uh, mitochondrial health improves uh, immune health. Uh, so things that increase glutathione, uh, some people can get N-acetylcysteine or NAC. You know, that can be a supplement you can get. Uh, I like to use um, MSM, a methylcephalomethane. It's an elemental sulfur. Uh, and you can get powder form or capsule form. You can mix it in water drinks. It has a little tart taste to it. So you may mix it with like one smoothie or something. But that increases, that decreases inflammation increases glutathione production. Uh, so supplement like that. Uh, I'll give um, uh, B vitamins uh, targeted as needed. Uh, and that's when we measure the vitamins, magnesium. Lots of people are magnesium deficient. Uh, we measure those. We may target magnesium. Uh, vitamin D is extremely important. Um, the, probably the reason we have problems with seasonal flu and infection during the winter time, uh, and this problem is any time of the year, winter time is worse, is uh, we really need vitamin D. Vitamin D is more of a hormone than a vitamin. We call it vitamin D, it behaves more like a hormone, but most of us are vitamin D deficient. Uh, if you think of how we, you know, were living, let's say, I don't think you have to go a hundred years ago, a thousand years ago, but you know, you know hundred years, 200 years ago, we were mostly outdoors. And, and you go to communities where people are mostly outdoors. You know, we were farming or gathering, or people were hunting, walking around, and you only came inside for just shelter at nighttime, you know, protect you from the wild animals or whatever. And then you lived outside. 
And even when I was a little kid, we were outside, mowed the grass. And, you know, back those days, men worked on their cars, and you sat outdoors, you did things. So we were, especially in the summertime, you exposed to more sunlight. Now, there are other factors, too. If you live in Ohio or, you know, too far away from the equator, you're not going to get as much even in the summertime. But theoretically, in the summertime, being outdoors more, you should store more vitamin D that should last you during the winter. Now we're indoors. I mean, you know, we're on Zoom, we're on all sorts of things. And so we don't get vitamin D, so we have to supplement. I still encourage my patients to get outdoors as much as possible because fresh air and sunshine, I think, have benefits beyond just vitamin D. But you have to supplement. So I get my patients to get the vitamin D levels. The normal range is like 30 to 100 nanograms per ml. I try to get uh, at least above 50, but I try to get my patients around 80, between 80 and 100, and sometimes above 100. Um, there's data showing that the lower your vitamin D, the less chance you're going to, you know, survive a coronavirus infection, uh, the, the higher the vitamin D, the better. So a lot of these things are really important in terms of vitamins and minerals and vitamin D is right up there in terms of one. And then we typically tell our people to, to supplement about 5,000 international units a day. And then sometimes even more, I've done it where I've given them about 40,000. I'll do a vitamin D low, especially if it's very low. And they come in and they think they have a viral a syndrome. And we have like an immune boost protocol where um, we will put them on a lot of vitamin D in addition to some of the other vitamins. Wow. Thank you so much for all of this amazing information. Um, I've learned a lot this evening. Um, so I'm looking forward to just all of the changes that will probably hear from people who may watch this later on and decide to make a change. Um, I have one question before we sign up. Do you have any, what are your maybe top three vitamins? I'm, I'm sorry, not vitamins, top three vegetables and herbs um, that you would say that we should just absolutely incorporate into our daily life? Wow. That's a great, that's a great question. You know, um, I would say number one, would be an algae. So we use a blue green algae called E3 Live. And I'll email you the link to that. You can order that. Uh, you could probably exchange that with spirulina, get you a good quality organic spirulina. So one of those two. Um, I would say next to that would be uh, wheatgrass. If you have access to it. So doing wheatgrass shots would be good. And there's some place you can buy some frozen wheatgrass that's freshly is grown and freshly juiced and frozen. And so if you don't have time to get to a juice place or juice it yourself, you can buy, buy fresh grown uh, frozen wheatgrass. Then after that would be sprouts. Now I would say sprouts slash uh, uh, microgreens. Um, these are super nutrient dense foods. The reason I like them is because uh, you can grow sprouts in your house. Sprouts, you know, technically are grown in the dark. Microgreens can be grown in trays. You don't need a lot of space. Just a little sunshine, patio, whatever. And they're so nutritionally dense. And so eating these three foods at the top, I think would be very good. Now, of course, the leafy greens, spinach, kale, those things, you know, I think would be a very close fourth. Nice. Well, for someone who wants to follow up and get more information or even connect with you, how can they do that? Well, they can go to our website, uh, montgomeryheart.com, and I'll email that to you so you can share it uh, in the final version, montgomeryheart.com, or they can call our office at 713-599-1144. Uh, we have a number of online programs, coaching programs. It's just a lot of information. Um, on our website, if you go to montgomeryheart.com, you'll see in the top banner, there's a jumpstart program. It's a, very, it's a free 10-day detox. People may not want to do 30 days. <laughs> it's a 10-day raw detox. It's a video of me coaching you through it. And so that's montgomeryheart.com on the website. In the top banner, it's going to be a bright, uh, sort of a mustard orange background has jumpstart program you can sign up for that and you get like 10 day recipes and menus and you can get a lot of benefit remember i told you that maybe in 10 days came back doing great things so you know 10 days you put your mind to it 
make sure you're not traveling, make sure no parties, you know, get all the stuff out of the way, you know, you know, be all prayed up and be ready to go for it. But you can do a lot in that 10 days, just hundred percent raw. And a lot of people after 10 days, they say, well, let me just do another 10 days. And before you know it, you're 30 days into it. So it's not nearly as hard as you think. Uh, it's only just thinking about it. After you get past the first few days, it starts to get easier and easier and easier. But but there's a lot of information on our website and how to contact us and that type of thing. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us this evening and sharing all of this wonderful life-changing and life-saving information. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate uh, joining me. That was so informative. If you enjoyed tonight's discussion and learned something valuable, share this information with your loved ones and let's commit to treating our bodies better this year so that we can live long, qualitative lives. That's all for tonight. Tune in next Tuesday as we head down the street to two very popular and delicious Third Ward Treasures, Sunshine's Health Food Store and Vegetarian Deli, and E-Delicious Treats, also known as Crumbville. I can't wait. See you next Tuesday on The Avenue.